The United States just received a clear signal that counter-drone warfare is moving from experiments to scaled capability, a lightweight, Radar Q30 by 113mm gun system with fresh autonomy features is heading into production on American soil. EOS Defense Systems USA says its Slinger Remote Weapon Station will be built in Huntsville, Alabama, and that new software will let crews find, track, and prosecute small uncrewed aircraft more quickly while reducing the cognitive burden on operators. The timing matters. After years of studies and tech demonstrations, Frontline units are demanding a kinetic layer that can keep shooting long after missile racks are empty and electronic attack becomes saturated. A stabilized cannon that fires proximity airburst ammunition at quadcopters and fixed-wing micro-UAS is not a novelty anymore, it is the pragmatic middle tier that commanders keep asking for. What gives this gun and sensor node relevance is not the caliber alone but the way the package fuses sensors, computation, and control. The mount remains steady on the move, combining electro-optic and thermal channels with a compact electronically steered radar to maintain tracks on targets that are small, slow, low, and cheap. That radar-to-site queuing loop is decisive against drones that hover behind trees, scoot between buildings, or pop over berms. EOS's automation upgrade layers aided target recognition onto that loop, so the machine handles a larger share of the drudgery, detecting, classifying, and prioritizing candidates, before the human approves or supervises fire. The selectable autonomy model matters, commanders can lock the system into strict human in the loop for sensitive sites, push to on the loop for contested approaches, or adopt guarded modes where engagement logic is more assertive but bounded by rules of engagement. Economics is the other part of the story. Missiles are exquisite and scarce, Drones are expendable and plentiful. A short burst of airburst fused 30mm rounds that throws a lethal cloud across a flight path is far cheaper per engagement than most interceptors, and the ammunition can be stocked in depth at forward locations. When stabilization, accurate ranging, and decent fire control push first round hit probability upward, the rounds per kill drops, which saves both money and dwell time on the trigger. That is crucial in urban settings where stop-line logistics, power plants, or headquarters require defense without spraying the neighborhood. A magazine-deep effector also gives commanders the confidence to defend against nuisance tracks rather than saving shots strictly for confirmed one-way attack. Huntsville production is not just a zip code choice, it is a bet on integration and supply chain. The Redstone ecosystem already hosts the U.S. Army's Air and Missile Defense Enterprise, program offices, test ranges, and prime contractors. Building this class of weapon near those stakeholders accelerates fit checks with battle management systems and simplifies sustainment conversations. It also signals to U.S. buying authorities that the vendor is serious about domestic content, exportability to allies who prefer U.S.-made subsystems, and iterative software releases under American cybersecurity discipline. In practical terms, the local line enables, build a little, test a little, learn a lot, cycles where autonomy modes, ATR thresholds, and radar site fusion can be tweaked with user feedback rather than waiting for a distant factory batch. Interoperability is more than a brochure term in the counter-UAS mission. U.S. and Allied forces increasingly run their short-range air defense as a system of systems, multiple radars feeding a common picture, electronic attack softening the target set, and diverse effectors closing kills as appropriate. The Slinger family's lineage includes integrations with the Army's FAD C-2 backbone on directed energy demonstrators, which is a non-trivial credential. If an effector already speaks the network language, track formats, message latencies, engagement authorities, it can plug into the tactical architecture with fewer surprises. That lowers fielding risk and aligns with the joint CUAS office's insistence on modular, open approaches validated at recurring events like the Yuma trials. For buyers juggling MSHORAD modernization and base defense under budget pressure, an open, radar queuable gun system that plays well in the network checks important boxes. The industrial backdrop also favors multi-role mounts. 
A remote weapon station that can ride on a JLTV and then migrate to a patrol boat without wholesale redesign offers economies of scale. European navies are already probing close-in drone defeat for harbor security and littoral patrols, where small UAS can scout, harass, or act as spotters for loitering munitions. A stabilized 30mm with airburst effects, tied to compact radar and ATR, gives crews a repeatable, day-night answer that doesn't require a missile battery on every pier. On land, the same mount covers convoy overwatch, perimeter defense for fuel farms and ammunition depots, and pop-up protection for temporary command posts. With magazine depth and rapid slew, it can service multiple tracks in quick succession, something that single-shot missiles can struggle to do cost-effectively. No autonomy feature is free of controversy, and the deepening automation here will invite scrutiny. The promise is faster handoff and fewer operator errors under fatigue, the risk is overtrusting classification in cluttered environments. The wiser interpretation is that autonomy in this context is about managing tempo and attention, not replacing judgment. By exposing knobs to enforce human-in-the-loop, mandate dual-sensor confirmation, or constrain firing arcs near civilian structures, developers can keep the commander in charge of risk while still accelerating the detecticide defeat chain. In practice, units will likely tune modes differently, base defense might prioritize conservative gating, while maneuver brigades escorting logistics in gray zones could bias for speed with guardrails. Either way, the maturation of ATR inside the effector, rather than only in the sensor fusion layer upstream, shortens the physical and software distance between seeing and shooting. The competitive landscape underscores why these choices matter now. Rainmetal's Skyranger turrets, American M. Shorad variants, and several Asian gun radar hybrids all argue that the world is converging on a gun-centric layer to complement jamming and missiles. What differentiates winners will be weight, recoil management, stabilization on rough terrain, ability to ingest external tracks without latency penalties, and the sophistication of algorithms that decide when a small flying dot is just a hobbyist or a hostile. Here, a sub-400 kg package that can be bolted to common tactical vehicles, pre-wired for FAD C2, and manufactured in the US begins with advantages. Add a track record of remote weapon deliveries across multiple theaters, and procurement officers gain confidence that the vendor can sustain spares, training, and software refreshes through the life of the program. There is also a doctrinal adjustment underway. For years, many forces treated small drones as a nuisance best handled by jammers and ad hoc measures. Conflicts since have shown that cheap UAS are reconnaissance hubs, artillery spotters, and strike assets whose cumulative effects are strategic. That reality is pushing air defense down to battalions and even companies, with commanders needing tools they can afford to keep ready every day of a deployment. A mobile cannon with programmable fuses, a radar small enough to ride on the mount, an ATR that flags targets without tunnel visioning the crew is an answer scaled to that echelon. It will not defeat every cruise missile or glide bomb, but it can blunt the daily bleed of quadcopters and one-way drones that wear down units and expose supply chains. The strategic consequence of localizing this production is that the US can flex capacity as demand spikes without jockeying for overseas slots. It also allows rapid tailoring for U.S. export rules and allied integration needs, from encrypted radios to national battle management gateways. As more test data accumulates, on engagement distances, burst sizes, fuse reliability, and sensor false alarm rates, the case for a standardized, network-native gun layer will likely sharpen. And because the cost curve favors guns over missiles for most small UAS threats, even incremental improvements in automation and stabilization translate directly into more defended hours per logistics dollar. In short, moving a proximity-optimized 30mm effector with radar queuing and selectable autonomy into American production is less about one product announcement and more about a shift in how the U.S. intends to handle the drone problem at scale. The approach is unsentimental and utilitarian, make the kill chain shorter, make the shots cheaper, make the integration cleaner, and give commanders a dial for how much autonomy to apply.
If that formula holds in operational testing and early fielding, the middle layer of layered air defense, long neglected and perennially under-resourced, may finally have a dependable workhorse.